for the listeners, Faisal, do you want to let them know a little bit about your story, how you got into what you do today? I mean, it's been since what, 2014 that you've been with CIBC Wood Gundy, is that correct? That's right. That's right. So so my, my story starts back to when actually I was 16. Um, I was uh, working on a, a summer job for an advisor. Um, I was basically calling up his clients and booking appointments for him. Uh, and so what basically came from that was I got to listen to a bit of a conversation he was having with a client. And uh, the door was open a little bit and you can hear some of the conversation. And I'm like, wow, this person is actually helping another individual manage their finances, get them in the right uh, the right shape for their future and so forth. And then um, like, why can't I do this? And I find out you get paid for this. This is even better, right? So uh, it all started when I was 16. And I think that's what I want to do uh, for a living. And so I worked my way through uh, university and worked my way through uh, a couple of financial institutions, start building my own my own practice, merged my practice with now my business partner, Dave Popovich. And, and now you're here uh, 25 years later, here I am. You guys are on a radio show. I mean, for years I've been hearing it, you know, and it's um, talk about branding. It's amazing. Yeah, it's it's been really good for not only branding, but an opportunity for us to speak to our our clients and listeners and viewers out there uh, for for now almost fifteen years, and so it's been it's been really good. It gives us an opportunity to stay on top of things and and give a different angle to how we see it versus what you might hear in mainstream. And you have your own show as well. Yeah, I've got uh, two of them. So Dave and I also have a podcast and radio video show called More Than Money, and that comes out on a weekly basis. And then we have I have my own uh, uh, entrepreneurial uh, show called Kermali Exchange, uh, and it's uh, it's been growing and uh, been doing that for a few years as well. What made you decide to go into creating a show and stepping out of the norm? You know, most advisors for just staying what they only know and not touch other things. You said this is what I want to do is outreach to the community. Yeah. First of all, it's to to establish a community. There was a part of the when Dave and I started the actual show, we told the uh, the, uh, the the station manager at the time said, you know, we don't want to do just a finance show like that's that's been done. Books have been written about finance. That's 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 boring to be to be honest with you. Most people don't retain the information, and unless you're a nerd like me, you're not going to listen to the whole thing. Uh, and so, when when you get the opportunity to talk about a certain person's phase in their life, let's talk about retirement because that's that's what we focus on in our practice. They go through many different uh, phases within that journey, and it's more than just the money. Hence, the name of our show called More Than Money. So we talk about financial stuff for sure, but there's political, there's there's uh, legal, there's lifestyle, which is a, where a big focus, healthcare, and the different types of issues that come up. So you go through a lot uh, in the, let's call it the second half of your life. So let's talk about all the things. It's not just about the finances. And I think that gives us a different viewpoint on how we how we take care of our clients, how we manage our our clients' as money, and how we actually build a proper process to to bulletproof their, their lifestyle and retirement. This new generation, are they focused on retirement or is it a shift now where it's that whole YOLO mentality of you only live once? Yeah, I I love that that comment of YOLO. I think that's a very um, interesting piece because of where we are. I think what most, and I will call younger generations, let's go after the boomers all the way down. Okay, And so um, I think retirement becomes an issue when it becomes in sight. Everything else has been a, is a distraction to re, uh, to retirement. Now I say distraction, but we call it life. It's uh, you know when you're coming out of school, you're starting to build your career, or you're starting to build your business. Uh, that's one phase of your life. You're not really focused on retirement. You've been given some pieces of advice, like save for the long term, but you don't really know what that retirement is going to look like. And to be honest with you, most people don't realize what retirement looks like until they're in retirement. So um, planning for that is very challenging. We always focus on the last 10 years before you you make that decision to live off your savings. But I think the younger generations have got something or a big advantage that uh, I didn't have when I was their age or the generations before me didn't have when it was their, when their ages because they've got multiple ways of making income. We've always been taught to earn your income, save your money, live within your means, I think this generation has the opportunity to say it's not only an expense control side, 
there's a revenue opportunity. We can make more money, just do more things. The gig economy came with this generation. And I think that's fantastic. So they're, they're starting to see there's, there's more to it than just saving your pennies for the future. It's how to make more money now. Interesting. Yeah, that's a, it's a shift in uh, mentality, isn't it? And, and I think that's what technology and, uh, and the advancement of how we see this world has really helped. I think if you look at generation over generation, it's always been an advancement. And now this advancement is it doesn't have to be the norm. It doesn't have to be working at your job for 40 years and then sitting on a rocking chair on your porch for the rest of your life. There's so many uh, different phases. And people today that are retiring are saying, my retirement's not my dad or mom's retirement anymore. It's going to be completely different. I think that's that's because we've evolved as a as society. We've got, we've got other things we want to do. Say if someone's in their mid thirties, what is the best options for them to look at retirement? Is that a time to look or absolutely? No, it's, it's a good time to look at, it. and I think no matter where you are in your in your stage of life, thirty years old or any other time, we've got to take your your life in in smaller chunks. What's going to happen over the next twelve months, over the next three to five years, five to ten, and then ten years and beyond, and start to plan for all those different phases of your life. And so when you're looking at that short-term perspective, which most of us spend a lot of our time on, that you're going to get distracted. Then you also have to remember there's a greater than 10-year viewpoint. So if you start putting money aside at that, and it doesn't have to be a lot of money, it can be very little, but have that discipline for the long term, it pays itself over the long term. But you're also focusing on the short term. When you get married, have kids, and starting a business, expanding it, all these different things are going to happen in your life. So make sure you understand what each time zone and time frame is, and then plan and invest and save for all those different time frames. How many buckets should someone have? So, so we've got our checkings, our savings, you know, a rainy day fund, now a retirement fund. How many of them do you need? So I think the the proper is structure of your finances will give you fee, will give you freedom in your finances. Now, how you structure it, the purpose of savings is for to be spent sometime in the near future. So that's one part of it. Now that could be broken down by different types of investments or basic savings account. Your day-to-day -day spending is your checking account. So I totally agree with those two buckets. But there's a different way when you start looking at your lifestyle needs and then assets you want to acquire. So I look at lifestyle needs, like you said, a vacation fund or purchasing a vehicle, something that will depreciate or be gone within a short period of time. That's your short-term money. You're, you're going to be saving for those events or or, or, or um, products that you're going to be purchasing. But then there's also your long-term. You always want to make sure that your fourth bucket, so checking savings for the future, your, your short-term purchases, you're also investing so you can make more for yourself, more income for yourself. So you're not relying on that 40-year career. You've got multiple ways of making money. And that way you can be, be financially secure. So you're not 100% depend on one outcome. You've got multiple outcomes to reach your, your objective. For sure. If someone, for example, has got making, I don't know, say $60,000 a year, can they put money aside, depending on their lifestyle, I guess, but can they put money aside and purchase assets? So sooner or later, you know, it becomes wealth versus time versus freedom. Absolutely. And I think you kind of you kind of said it you in the answer already, but what I was going to say is it depends on how much you spend. And I think person making, let's use the number sixty thousand that you used, is definitely the ability to save. Now, what are you saving for? If it's retirement, remember in Canada, we have some guarantees in here, some some cushions, I'll call it. We have Canadian pension plan, we have old age security, we have government income supplement. So if you're making sixty thousand dollars, how much money do you need to live off? On, on on your own right now and your lifestyle cost part will be by the secure uh, program are already available there's other programs like pension plans and so forth that will be a, that will be another way of, of savings or for savings and then your own cash savings so you know you're going to hear rules or tips out there of saving 10 percent of your income and so on and so forth and and those are all accurate i just think start with a plan if you need $60,000 a year in your lifestyle, what are your sources of income? You're going to have a gap on what's guaranteed to you, like CPP and OAS, and then fill it up with your savings. And then then you've got that freedom as opposed to this rule of 10%, because it might be 5% or it might be 20%. I don't know, but a plan will give you that answer. And that's the best way to find out where your course of action should be.
for yourself and your strategy, do you look at long-term investments and in terms of assets such as um, low-risk, Nike, Colgate, etc.? Or is it cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and all of that lifestyle stuff? Yeah, so I'm a boy and then also old school. Uh, so I'm spoiled in the sense that in my career, I have had the discipline, the education and the time on post to actually understand the value of an asset. And if I don't understand the value of an asset, let's say cryptocurrency, I'll shy away from it. If I'm going to participate in an asset or an investment or an idea that I don't understand the, the actual intrinsic value of, then to me, that's speculating or gambling, which is okay if that's your fun money, but it's not going to be my my long-term retirement fund or my kid's education fund, or if I want to purchase a vacation property in the future, I'm not going to bet on something I don't understand. I'm going to put my, my, my knowledge and time uh, and being old school, I can actually tell you, is that value of that company overvalued or undervalued given the current economic conditions and where we're headed? Um, so I, I have that old school mentality. And when I look at some of the most wealthiest people in the world, they've done it the old fashioned way. They've earned it and they've built it over time. So why not invest in businesses that have grown over time? That's what I do. When you hear about this in the news and all over social media about the recession coming, what are your thoughts on that? And uh, what is some reassurance you could give individuals out there? Yeah, and I, I think the word recession is, uh, is scary, but it's ambiguous. It means lots of different things. There's the technical term of a recession, and there's the actually what you feel in a recession. And so what the markets are basically pricing out right now is that there's a higher probability we're going to be entering into a recession. Now, when I look at what the markets are indicating, primarily the bond market, it's telling me that this recession is not going to be deep. It's not going to be catastrophic. You're not going to see people dropping a whole bunch of keys to their homes, uh, to the, the banks because they can't afford their mortgages. There'll be some of that, but it's not going to be as big as, let's say, 2008 uh, crisis. That's what the market's saying today. The data I'm seeing, the way the companies are still making revenue, the way people are still spending money does not seem like it's going to be a deep recession. It'll be more of a shallow, narrow recession. It will impact the ones who are on the fringe, who've overextended themselves, who've got more expenses than they have revenue, who have been who've gambled or hedged uh, in the wrong way. They're going to be exposed consider, uh, considerably. But the lion's share of people in this country and in most of the Western world are going to be going to be okay. It's just going to take some time to get out of it. It's the developing nations uh, that I, I really worry about. I think those are the areas are going to see catastrophic changes uh, because whenever uh, the U.S. gets you know gets the sniffles, the world usually gets the flu, and then some actually get it even worse. So we got to be careful of those countries. You know, it's so much of a this political climate that we're in. You know, are we on the verge of World War Three? Does that affect the markets and how people want to invest today? Because, you know, that old school saying of let's keep all the money underneath the mattress. Yeah, short term. Yes, the 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 geopolitical risk war or any other thing will cause market volatility. But people have to take a step back and say, hang on, why is the market volatile given the information that we're giving? And the reason for that is they're speculating, they're guessing the outcome. And you would agree it may go one direction. I may agree it goes into a different direction. And so that was, that's what makes a market. One of us is going to be right. One of us is going to be wrong. And you hope that over time, you're going to be more right than wrong. And that's what happens even in any war. If I go back over the last 100 years, think about all the political conflicts we've had close to, you know, from the Cuban Missile Crisis, where that could have been World War III, all the way to now, which that's coming up as another tone. We have seen in the last hundred years, many political conflicts, but yet we've always evolved. We've always grown. Portfolios have always made money over, let's say, any 10-year period uh, in, in Canada. That just gives you that comfort knowing that as long as you've got the right time horizon with the money, it will be in your, in your play. If you've got a short-term play, that's where the risk comes up. Have you seen um, opportunities in re recessions? That's the best time to make money is in a recession. The best time is not to look when everybody's making a lot of money. It's when everybody's running for the hills. It's when everybody's selling their assets. In fact, I love recessions so much that people sell their assets for pennies on the dollar. And that means I can scoop them up, take them in for myself, for my clients, 
and we can make a lot of money that way. It's times like this, and if it does get worse, watch the panic that it will it will bring into people, and that's when we can scoop in and, and, and make a return. The biggest amount of returns are made from a recession and beyond, not from the peak of an economy and when it contracts. I think Dell, it was, was built through a recession. And I mean, so many companies that you see today were built out of recession. Yeah. Absolutely. And technology evolution is based on hard times. What what evolves in an industry, and you can look at some of the, the like Uber and companies like that, who basically game changed the taxi business, turned it into a technology on wheels, was phenomenal. But that came out of a, a change during tough times. And so that's where, you know, you're going to see more and more businesses evolve, more and more businesses be created and brand new business that we never even thought of will start because of, of bad economic issues. It's funny. A few years ago, if you said, hey, one is Zoom, uh, it was a hard thing to convince someone to do. Now it's just such a norm because yeah. the pandemic, you know, we, we evolved as humans and said, this is a tool we need. Not Absolutely. Like, uh, and we're, it was so quick. What we evolved in the in the in the two years in the pandemic made people evolve so quickly. But when you look at technology over the generations, you know, before it was Morse code to telephone, from telephone, you know, in, in between that to cell phone to now online video chat, like you and I are doing. Um, the 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 last two that I mentioned happened a lot quicker in time than the first two that I mentioned, uh, and that's just because of the way the evolution now works. It just moves a lot faster than it ever has before. How do you find time for yourself with managing clients, family, life? So I think time structure again equals time freedom. So for me, when I'm I'm here at home with my family, I take some time out for you. I can go back to my family, uh, spend some time with them. I always have to structure myself as well, taking time away. So I, I do disengage. I do get away. I do have to recharge my batteries. Um, so I, I structure that all in. And that gives me the freedom to know that I'm going to have a recharge. I'm going to be able to put the number of hours I put in. Um, I've always had the mantra, work like nobody does so you can live like nobody can, right? And that mantra that I've, I've stuck by, that's why I wake up earlier than most. That's why I read more than most. That's why I, I do more than most. But I also have to worry about me. And so taking time out for myself, my family is important. Um, and it's just it's just as important as building my business or researching companies or 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 even being on media. All that stuff is part of me, but uh, you, I do take time out for myself. In the ups and downs of life, um, what makes you tick to push through the tough times? And then you've seen this market change over time, up, down, left, right, you name it. Yeah, it, it comes back to why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I talked about earlier about how I got on board into my career. Um, what made me build this this practice was what I've seen my parents go through. My business partner saw what his parents went through. Um, my father, for example. So my mom passed away 25 years ago. Um, but my father, when he approached to retirement, um, he took a safer route to uh, to his investing and to his retirement plan. So he didn't take as much risk and therefore he didn't have as much growth. And so now he's working from a smaller pot or at least he feels that way. So he's always saying, I can't do this. I don't have enough money. I can't do this because if I wish I had more, I could do the following. And now he has five grandchildren and he's not able to do the things he wanted to do because he feels he doesn't have enough cash flow. And so that was one thing that I said, I am on a mission to speak to my clients that they are going to have the opportunities of the lifestyle they want, not because of the volatility in the market. I want to make sure that they have those opportunities. So that, that mission that I have, um, what keeps me going is there's a lot of people who've taken on too much risk and have lost a lot. And there's a lot of people who don't take enough opportunity to see the growth in their portfolio so they can achieve those lifestyle, those, those things that you really value and you want to do. My father was a big traveler in the past, and I can probably count on, the number, on, the, on one hand how many times in the last 10 years he's traveled with his family now, and that's partly because of a, a financial issue, 
partly because he's older, it's a health issue, and partly because he wants to leave a legacy. Can you believe that he wants to take care of his, his children and grandchildren, and we're all fine, we can take care of ourselves. But those are the four areas, income, growing your money, your health care, and your legacy. Those are the four areas I saw that were problems in his situation. My business partner saw similar issues with his parents, and that's how we built this practice. And that's been our mission to make sure that we impact 1 million Canadians in some way so that they can have that lifestyle that they've always wanted in their, in their retirement. Where do you see yourself in 20 years? Ooh, 20 years takes me um, 67 years of age. I see myself doing even more than I do now. I think that evolution of where we're going to be and, and forget about the investment side. Let's talk about how we connect with people is going to be more important. I think as we get more and more technology, we disengage with human beings and they will need us. They will need people like us to help them through their, their retirement when it comes to their businesses. They're going to be, they'll need more help in their businesses. And so being part of that, I think it's going to evolve. And one thing that I'm really fortunate of is I have a great team. I've got a couple of younger advisors who come on board um, now it's about them. Now it's about how they can impact others. So through them, we can impact a lot more. So building the business for the next generation as well is going to be important. So fast forward 20 years, that's the time when I can say, okay, let's turn, let's put our foot on the pedal and let's get it for the next generation after that. And so that way, this, this company that we call Popwich Carmelli Advisory Group is not just a one generational company. It's one that goes on from generation to generation. How important is it to surround yourself with inspiring leaders, people, entrepreneurs, just anybody? I've seen the other side of it. I've been around people who are not motivated. I've I've hung out with people who who don't have that that motivation or that drive um, that suck the life out of you, and it doesn't feel good. It actually brings me backwards. And I've gone through my own personal uh, mental health issues. And part of it was because of who I surrounded myself with over the years. And as you disengage those people and you start focusing and putting your, your efforts around people who who you want to be uh, with and who you look up to or you can learn from, then it's always you're always going to push higher. I, I have this comment to, uh, to my kids. I've got two girls. Um, one's looking at university. And she looked at a couple of universities, which I would call them pretty easy to get in, uh, according to the, the marks that she has versus what they require. And I said, I would rather you be the dumbest person in the smartest school than the smartest student in the dumbest school. So focus on being in the best school as possible, where you're not the brightest, you can learn from a lot more people. And that is is something that we should take into our own personal lives and our, our professional lives, because that's, that's where you move forward. Yeah, it's funny when you said, you know, back then you had people in your life that it was like shackles, they're holding you down. Oh, with, with a ball and chain and that ball gets heavier and heavier and you're dragging it through the sand and the quicksand. It turns, that's what it turns into, which is unbelievable. And it does drag you down for sure. And sometimes it starts off as jokes, but it's those remarks that slowly start creeping in from, um, it was just a joke to, is it, are you trying to bring me down, bring the energy down, right? And the skeptical people. In life. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when you, when you look at, and, and, and think about if you were to build a, a, an investment portfolio of a bunch of companies you want to be, make millions of dollars with, which companies would you put in your portfolio? Which companies would you invest in? The ones that are doing more, getting more market share, making things happen. Well, why don't we invest in our own personal uh, portfolio ourselves in the same way? Who are we around? Are we investing our time, which is a non-renewable resource? You don't have unlimited time. Who are we investing our time with? Are those individuals helping our personal portfolio or are they dragging us down and making us lose lose money in, in, in quotes? Because I think that's where if we looked at the same concept, we would never buy a bunch of loser companies in our portfolio. Why the heck would we do that in our personal lives or our professional lives? Um, I don't know. Uh, I've done it before. I'm done investing in losers. Now it's time to only focus on winners. I love it. It's so true. Well, you know, there's that other side where I always think uh, you got to invest in everybody, but there's only so much bandwidth someone's got. And you're right. You know, they'll they'll bring you down with their energy, right? So you gotta... And it's a multiplier effect, Zach. I think when you have for every one person that pulls you down, you need two or three to pull you up, right? It's e it's It's a lot easier to fall down the stairs. It's a lot harder to climb them back up. And sometimes you need help of two or three people to get you back up and get you up the stairs. So 
that's the hardest part. I think it's a, a very important piece to surround yourself with people who are going to pull you up versus push you down. You know, Faisal, they say that you could have 20 people complimenting you and saying, great job, Faisal. But that one person that's like, you suck, Faisal, that will eat you alive. You know, it's yeah. that neg negativity versus yeah. positivity. So, yeah, you're right. You need two or three people to lift you up versus that one person. Absolutely. And then that's also a reflection of what you're taking in. If you're taking that negativity and you're making it yourself, then you are that person. But if you don't allow it to be, that starts with a lot of work on your own self. And then you can actually put the right people, the right investments in your portfolio, for example. I um, love that outlook on it. Yeah. yeah. When you look at success, how do you define it before we get going here, Faisal? Yeah. So success to me is making sure that you have purpose and fulfillment. It's not about money. It's not about uh, the people around you. It's not about the things that you own. It's do you have purpose and fulfillment. Without purpose and fulfillment, you're an empty shell. You got a lot of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> All the gray hair I'm hiding. <laughs> yes. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it, man. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll get together soon. Absolutely. Everything else is good, though? All is well. All is well. Yeah. Fantastic. We should connect, go to a game or something and Please, yeah. spend some time together. Mm -hmm.